it was a lot of false starts, a lot of me, me at 1 a.m. I'm running a, like a business, you know, a real a tech business, right? You can get paid. You got to come at 4 a.m. You go at 4 a.m. And then like, they're not there or they won't open their door. You know, it was crazy stuff that would happen. Hey, co-founders, welcome to Made It with Connor Tompkins, a podcast where we meet with badass entrepreneurs who've successfully exited their companies, discussing everything from the wins and losses of entrepreneurship to the next steps after the exit. To not miss out on these exciting stories, be sure to subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Let's dive in. Hey, everyone. I'm here with Shane Neiman. He is the founder of Junebug and also Easy Texting. And he's doing some fantastic stuff right now with uh, Neiman Ventures, which we'll get into um, here in just a bit. Uh, some of it's crazy and mind blowing. So um, stay tuned and we'll talk about humanoid robots and the Santa Monica Pier. And, but for the most part, I really want to jump in, Shane, into your, your journey as an entrepreneur and what it was like um, going through that exit transition. What was the premise for Junebug? And then how did you find that there is this kind of like blue ocean there um, as far okay. as text messaging? So Jumba came out of um, a failed attempt at another startup. So my first startup was in 1999. Uh, we called it Offix, and it was uh, we raised some venture capital. I was actually in medical school before I was at going to NYU Med, and my roommate was uh, working at Goldman. He was like partying and making a lot of money, and uh, I was in my room studying all the time, like 24 hours a day. Uh, <laughs> That's and not fair. He was make, he was making fun of me. It was a Sunday morning. He had just come from partying at 7 a.m. And he convinced me to drop out and do a startup with him because he would raise all the millions of dollars. And I had a degree in computer science. And to kind of condense that portion really short, we we decided to make an ASP, which is basically um, now called SAS, before it was called an application server, uh, service provider. We try to essentially make Microsoft 365 right now, uh, but through using Citrix, all the Windows based applications would be running on our servers. You get the latest version, we'd host your files. We had an app store, but we were way too early for our time. We had a great product. It worked, but you know, dot com bubble burst. I had saved up a couple hundred thousand dollars from programming in college which was a lot of money for me, by the way. Uh, and so I lost it all and I went broke and I literally moved in with my girlfriend. She was going to FIT at the time uh, and she lived in a dorm and I was living out of a garbage bag uh, and because I couldn't pay my rent. And so yeah, I started going to out to nightclubs because she was doing a door at a few of the places in New York to make some money on the side and I started looking around and I started seeing how backwards that industry really was. Uh, they were taking down things on paper. Um, they, they were giving out flyers, uh, that, that were telling about future events that were being thrown on the floor, like garbage. Uh, they had girls going around taking phone numbers and they would call people the next week to invite them. Uh, so as from a marketing and also just a, a operational standpoint, they were not technically advanced at all. And so to kind of also condense that, uh, we, we ended up building the tech stack for the most of the nightclubs and bars used called Junebark. A lot of people know us more for our front facing website, which aggregated all the events that were going on in New York City and other major cities and put them on our website. And we have photographers that would go around and take pictures at events and post them. And we would collect data. And we had this huge database of people who would go out, um, you know, young urban professionals with disposable income, this really elusive de demographic. Um, yeah. So we realized from that point of view on the consumer facing side, we had this advantage, but we also powered the tech that you know, the POS, the, the, the ticketing system, we built one. This is the pre-event, right? Pre-camera phone, pre-space blog, pre-myspace time. You like combined uh, like 10 different businesses into one business idea. And each of those 10 became like their own, uh, almost like unicorn business down the road. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it was in an unlikely industry. So that industry is a very tough industry. You're dealing with unscrupulous people. You're dealing with short-sighted people. We we did all different types of venues, uh, big venues, um, even some concert venues uh, that were too small for for, for Ticketmaster to to, to service. It, It was actually easier because it was early because really there was no MailChimp. So like... People didn't have it. We, we, I would buy servers in our, and we had an office in Chelsea. We had a rack in our office and I would buy these Cisco servers that literally we wrote our own software to load balance, sending out emails across these servers because there was nothing available for us to do out of the shelf. Did you have uh, partners with this? Like, how did this start? And then how did you get your first sales? Did, or did you go door to door on the nightclub scene? My girlfriend was my partner. You know, we at the time, we weren't equal partners. But then just a piece of advice, do not go into business with your girlfriend or your wife. Um, but we were smart enough and um, let's say mature enough to not let that, uh, even though we broke up pretty quickly into it, um, not to let that uh, affect us and continue to be friends and partners. Um, and so she she had some, you know, inroads because she was working the door at some, at some of the clubs. And so that's what we used. And actually being a girl and guy duo really worked really well for us because inevitably whoever we were dealing with would either take to me or take to her. Uh, and so we would go to meetings together and just when one of us was being favored we would the other person would sit back and and let that person lead it was a lot of false starts a lot of um you can talk me me at 1 a.m uh i mean 1 a.m i mean I, i'm running a like a business you know a real attack business right and so yeah but we, we did what we had to do we'd go and then sometimes we'd show up and no one would be there or the door would be closed even getting paid, sometimes they don't say, okay, yeah, yeah you, you can get paid. You got to come at 4 a.m. You go at 4 a.m. And then, like, they're not there. Or they won't open their door. Or, you know, it was crazy stuff that would happen. It's kind of like uh, being in a frat and having to be hazed and, and, and going through that hazing period until you become part of the frat. And then, you know, you get a different kind of respect. Once you become entrenched into the ecosystem, then none of that stuff is really happening to you anymore. So Shane, essentially you had to be a pledge in a, almost like the New York nightclub and multiple different markets nightclub scene. Yes. And then you, uh, you matured over the, the next yes. few years inside the society. And then they knew who you were and you knew who they were. Yes. Um, did, and then we could set the terms that? That, that, that we set the terms of how we were. Right. So like, no, I'm not going to come for a, um, give me a credit card, you know, like, like everything. Uh, and we, we, we kind of normalize things a little bit more. What we also realized is because they used our software is that, um, we saw how much money they were making and, um, we said, well, we should do events and eat our own dog food. So why don't we try that? And, um, and quickly we realized that there are two nights a year, everybody goes out and spends a lot of money. Um, Halloween and New Year's and New Year's in particular. Um, and people will pay ungodly sums of money uh, for New Year's because that's their like one night out and it's amateur right. night and, you know, they, they, they want to make the best of it. We actually started doing something that no one had ever done before, which we would rent out, you know, venues and, and then, you know, prepay for them. And then throw an event. And we would do also like unlikely places, not just like a nightclub, like Marquee or whatever, Tower, or whatever, that kind of stuff. We would do like Dave and Buster's, right? In Times Square, because we realized that people wanted to bring their kids and that's a place that you could bring their kids. And it's in Times Square. People would pay triple to do that. Um, and then once we started cornering that market, we started doing really advanced things like controlling ticket prices, knowing the velocity of ticket sales, you know, then, then being able to dynamically price them and even being able to predict how much money we were going to make and how much profit we were going to make on, on a, on a particular, um, event. 
and, and, and we started doing it on a much larger scale. There's so much involved in this, the technical side, right? You have the sales and marketing yeah. engine. You also ha are running these events and each event that you do is probably has a lot of lift, right? It's Not only are you helping facilitate events for other people, you're also taking it in house. That's a lot of work. How did you guys scale? It's, what did that look like on the people side? Honestly, I didn't take the side of the business. I let my, my partner do that side of the business and she was very good at that. Um, so she, she, she was, uh, really the events person. Uh, so the logistical was a nightmare, I know, and even hiring people for that night. And we learned a lot, like DJs don't show up, people don't show up. So we have to have backup plan after backup plan, you know, Murphy's law, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. That was a long haul. I did, I did June bug for 10 years. It, it, you know, it, we learned a lot over 10 years and it was a fully blitz shop business, by the way. You have a little bit of a overlap between Jimbug and easy texting. So if you don't mind outline, where were you at the, towards the end of Jimbug? How much revenue were you generating? How many employees did you have on, on the payroll? And then how did you make that decision to make that transition? We were doing almost 70 million in, in, in revenue, uh, at towards the end, um, you know, ticket sales were a big part of that. Um, and then we also had our recurring software and we had advertisers like Johnny Walker, Mercedes, um, those kinds of people who wanted to get to that demographic, especially on our website. Um, we also monetized our email list. So, you know, you could send out an email about your, uh, event or about your product and we could really target, we were doing really advanced stuff. I can bring men between the ages of 24 and 34 to your Johnny Walker event in New York City or in Philadelphia or in wherever it was, which not, not too many people were able to do at that time. It was a really big business, but what happened was towards the end, uh, like 2005 ish, uh, the efficacy of email started to really dwindle a lot. Uh, mainly because we weren't the only email in town. Now, now we didn't have, you know. We had racks of servers and stuff like that, but now constant contact was around, you know, MailChimp was around, um, people created their own websites. Now you were getting an email from the nightclub, the DJ, the promoter, the, you know, I don't know, your grandmother, <laughs> you were getting emails from everyone. And so we had no way of really cu cutting through the clutter, but a black, you know, I had a Blackberry at that time and Blackberries were starting to become really popular and people were texting a lot more, uh, as the, in the United States. And we had this database of you know, over a million people. We had their phone numbers. I realized, Hey, we need to figure out how to text these people. Again, just like before, there was no off the shelves, out of the box solution, like a MailChimp or a constant contact where it could, you know, connect our database send out mass text messages and it was as simple as that right now i mean easy texting right now is much more sophisticated than just sending out a mass text message you know you can do advanced campaigns and stuff like that but in the beginning that's all we needed we just needed a way to send a mass text and there was nothing like that the open rate for texting is insane even today i can't imagine what it was back then it was almost like uh back in the day you were excited to get like a a piece of mail, you know, like, like you're excited to yeah. get a text. You're like, this is a big deal. I have friends. That's actually what happened. So, so uh, to, uh, to make a long story short, I couldn't find it. So I built it and it took a little while to figure it out because it's not like sending an email you have to have connectivity into the phone systems. But I believe that we were the first public facing API, SMS API in the United States. But we were definitely the first platform, you know, like that SMBs could use to do SMS uh, campaigns, especially through short codes. Right now, people have, you know, regular phone numbers and that's become the norm. And now easy texting does that too. But back then, you couldn't really do it through a regular phone number. You had to do it through a short code. What happened was, was that I figured it out and we had this internal tool to do this. And I send out the first text message for our Halloween event and it was bananas. 
it was it, it was crazy. We hadn't sold so many tickets in a short amount of time than that. It was, it was a problem because our servers couldn't handle it. We weren't ready for that. We had a lot of the club owners and the promoters and everyone on our met on our list. My phone started blowing up and people were like, how did you do that? I want to do that. And the light bulb went off, right? Wow. This, this is something that other people want. So I started a spreadsheet of who wanted the software and then, you know, the alpha version then became the beta version, which we then decided we're going to give it to other promoters and nightclubs and sell this. And then you know, in a sound manner. And in the beginning, it was really funny because there, <laughs> we, we, we would literally demo them by getting them on the phone and giving them a temporary username and password, and they would have to do it themselves. We would walk them through how to do it. And then once they would send themselves a text message, the close rate was like 99%. They got it. They understood. It was very visceral for them, right? right they yeah. type out the text, they press the button, and it comes up on their phone like magic. That's when they open up their wallet and say, so we'd have them like sign up through a piece of paper like that they would type out and then fax to us, which is even crazier. And then two years into that, uh, um, I realized that easy texting is a much better business, much, much better, especially from the events business. The events business is like a one X, one Xer, like it's not worth more than one or two X maybe because it, you literally have to reinvent the business every single year. You got to resell right. tickets. You got to take the, the upfront risk of renting out the places, right? And uh, the venues, and you can have a bad year. You you have a crazy storm, snowstorm or something like that. If I owned it during COVID, I would have been crushed, right? Yeah, no Think kidding. And a buyer's probably looking at you, Shane, and looking at your two businesses, and they're like, I could either buy this event business where I have to roll up my sleeves and host 20 different events on New Year's Eve and work with nightclub owners and go through initia initiation, or I could do this yeah. text message business that yeah. has an insane open rate and everybody wants it and everyone gets it if they send one message. That, that wasn't hmm. the case at that time. So we sold yeah. June bike to a competitor that we had a, a big competitor that was really doing the same things was in the ticketing business. And he was happy to buy it because we had all the great places and he had come after us and he was always nipping at our heels. So we worked out something and I really wanted to get out anyway, because it was taking a really big toll on my life. I wanted to get married, um, working that hard and ha having to go out at night really is not conducive to, um, uh, you know, a, a serious relationship, children, you know, the next phase that, that was for me. Also, I had this this like shiny new object, which is easy texting, which arguably is a much better business in my opinion. And so we decided, I decided to sell that. And my, my partner and I, you know, went separate ways because she was interested in still doing events. And I just focused 24 seven for another eight years on easy texting. You did transition a little bit because you went from having a hundred people uh, that you were responsible for. And you found this other yeah. company that you can run that can do more volume with only 17. Few people from Junebug that had stayed with me the entire time, almost that whole 10 years, uh, they came with me to Easy Texting. And especially my CMO um, and my my assistant and a few other technical people, they, they came. Um, so it was, a, it was a group of the core Junebug people that, you know, were tried and true and loyal. Uh, and they came and then we, we built out the team, you know, like the, the marketing team and stuff like that here, but then we built out the technical team actually in Kiev. We actually, I actually physically went to Kiev for two or three months. I, we, we rented an office and we got the best of the best THC developers that would out code anybody here or just as good as anybody here. We got them for a fraction of the price because it was just not economical to do. My CTO is Ukrainian. My wife is Ukrainian. Um, so, so I had translators and, um, <laughs> they came with me as a practical matter. It was the right place for us to go. But mm -hmm. as also as, as, the, as it happened there, the young, you know, developers there were really, um, 
culturally very similar to the Western um, young people. What also helped is that they all had easy texting emails. There was a big easy texting sign and they didn't feel like they were working for an outsourcing company. Part of the success is that they, you know, they got the company updates. They got, they got raises just like we did. There were, they, they, they had certain marks to hit. And then I would bring people from Ukraine here. We would go there on, on trips, that, that, that kind of thing. I think it's pretty remarkable because if you think about the best talent in the United States, like where do they go to school? They sometimes go to Ivy Leagues like Harvard or they go work for a good company like Google. But you have this amazing talent and you can hire the best people in Colombia, in the Philippines, in Ukraine. How did you make the decision that it was the right time to sell? What was that process like for you? I was running my businesses like it was my career, not not really like thinking I would sell because you know I was doing these like seven, eight, nine, ten year stints, right? I mm-hmm. also I think coming from a bootstrap mindset, it's very different and you're much more careful about how you spend your money. There's definitely an advantage to being bootstrapped and uh, it had a big role to play for me as well. You're watching every dollar that goes in and goes out. Your profitability is your funding. That's it entirely. Yeah. And so yeah. you have to be creative and you have to use what you have. Yeah. Especially in the beginning when someone wanted to come and buy my business, um, they'd have to buy it for all cash because like I'm making a lot of money. Well, like, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to give up a company that's like throwing off a lot of cash for like stock of some company that I have no idea whether or not it's going to materialize into anything. Right. That was a little bit different about my, my thing. And then the other thing that I would get counterintuitively, and it's only honestly, if you're talking about 10 years since I more 10 years since I sold, sold the business. And right now it's a very, very big business. It's much bigger than I, I, when I sold it, it was a company called call fire. They did essentially what we did for texting. They did for calling. They, they realized the texting was going to take over calling. And it was very smart on there and to, to do it because that other part of their business is pretty much gone now. And e- they even changed their name from call fire to easy texting. What was really crazy when I was showing the business to other potential suitors, they were like poo-pooing the business being like, oh, this is like old pep, right? Like you need to be doing in-app messaging. And, like, and I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? It's the only app that's pre-installed on every freaking phone, whether it's a feature phone or a smartphone, right? Um, it's ubiquitous and it's open rates are insane and everybody uses it. Whenever you're looking to sell your company, you, you see if they're like asking the right questions. Do they get the business? Yeah. Do they understand it? Because if yeah. they don't, you're like, the employees are going to have our time. This company's not going to reach its full potential. I'm so happy that MailChimp didn't get it. If they got, they would have crushed me. If they just added texting to their we zip stop, <laughs> they would have crushed me. It was my advantage yeah. that they didn't know it. Actually, this guy Ben Chestnut, who sold um, Mailchimp, Mailchimp, wrote a whole right. blog post about how he thought that text messaging was spam and no one would adopt it. And by the way, now Intuit that owns it, they integrated texting into, into Mailchimp, <laughs> right? So, so like full circle, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's funny, right? So it's funny. Didn't he how also all, do a all... blog article talking about how he wasn't going to sell the business, and then like two or three weeks later, he sold the business. That's what ten billion dollars does, right? Ten billion or whatever they like, into it yeah. bought it for, right? Um, listen, I don't blame him. I mean, I would change my mind yeah. too. So I'll give me ten billion dollars for my business, but um, anyway. So how did I decide? I decided because, um, honestly, I was really burnt out. I, I mean, I had been running businesses for 20 years consecutively at that point, and I had made a good amount of money, but I couldn't enjoy it because I was stuck in this rat race. Listen, I'll never put it down because it made me who I am. And uh, that was a great phase of my life and I learned a lot from it and it sets the stage for the next 10 years or 20 years of my life. Like that healthy distance and ego, like you, you are not your company, but also there has to be a little bit of like sunk cost fallacy, like understanding this isn't the path for me and being willing to make that change or understand your bias. I'm super um, obsessed with decision making and like mental yeah. biases and, and, and I, I suffer from it a lot. It also 
helped me a lot not being stuck in this like one path kind of where you can find success. There's this book that I read that's like, Why Greatness Can't Be Planned, The Myth of the Objective. And, and so they actually, there's these two computer scientists that, you know, talk about search algorithms. And if you give the search algorithm an objective and it has to just meet that objective, it never goes through novel paths and it never really ever makes the objective. If you're open to novelty and not being stuck to one objective or one task, then you can you know, go down other paths that may not seem like they're going to get you there, but it does eventually. So I realized for myself, I really wanted to kind of get out, it, you know, if it, it was time for me. And then that's when I decided to start New Ventures, which essentially is my own family office, because I came to the conclusion that no one's going to really care about my assets and my wealth like like I am. Um, and so, you know, outsourcing that to someone. I, I'm going to be kicking myself, by the way, if we don't talk about Neiman Ventures and um, and the future of human robotics walking amongst okay. us and uh, the Santa Monica Pier. I've been trying to learn how to invest for the last 10 years, and I'm still learning. And I made a lot of really bad mistakes, but thankfully, I've never made a mistake where it took me out of the game. And I think that's the key is you never bet in such a way that you could get totally wiped out. And a lot of people end up doing that, especially if they have this bias of where they think they know and they can't. The, re the reality is you don't know what you don't know. And I've, I've invested in companies like Convoy, for example, which, you know, when I invested, it was like a $300 million A round or something. It was like, or seed round. And then, it, and then a few years later, about $3 billion valuation. And then last year, it just wound down and it went to zero. And then they've had like really good, really good exits. There are three main focuses that I, I do, uh, real estate. So I actually had a lot of real estate. Uh, exposure before that, because when my business, I come from an immigrant family, grew up in New York. My parents always taught me buy physical assets with whatever money you made. So I had cash flowing businesses. So I would buy real estate and I had a lot of good real estate understanding from that, from that point of view. The other is like private equity, right? So I did a lot of, uh, I did a lot of private equity type deals where they're more like mature businesses. But my passion really is an early stage venture. And I, I'm, I'm pretty agnostic when it comes to the type of early stage. So, you know, I do, I do, I do tech, I do biotech, CPG. We did, we were one of the first investors of, in athletic greens, for example, right? Which is like the lens, least picky, the techie thing you can think of. Right. The most recent things that I've done, uh, investments that I've done is, um, Bigger AI, which is a humanoid robot. Last year, when we wanted to go and invest, um, you know, I brought a bunch of my friends. We kind of took a look at the, the company together. He had built the NBA all-star team of robotics. A bunch of people from Boston Dynamics, from Tesla, from Apple, head of Google DeepMind, you know, like th those, those types of people that he recruited with his own money and his own talent. He had a computer-generated prototype of what he wanted to make, a humanoid robot that would replace uh, or, or enhance uh, warehouse workers, especially in the pick and pack space. And if you think about it, that, that's a very good use case for a humanoid robot because retrofitting a warehouse is way too expensive for people uh, to do. And you know the, the world is, 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 is made to interface with humans. And so right. the easiest thing is to put a human there that does what a human does and can learn what a human does instead of creating all these other systems that, you know, can get the job done that a human should be doing, right? Walkways, doors, handles, everything's designed yes. for a human hand, right? It, exactly. But he gave his presentation and it was really binary. Either people thought I was batshit crazy and they were like, there's no way he can do this in one year and make a, uh, make a make a prototype that actually works and, or people bought into it and they're like, he's the next Elon. I was on that side along with a bunch of my other friends. So we kind of did a big investment together. And then a month ago, he did it. Like he did it. He actually made a prototype 
that works. It, it's crazy because it, it learns through AI. So it watches the movement of people and it can mimic it and it, it could do it with just 10 hours. So it can now make a cup of coffee. It could, it could, you know, pick and pack. It's starting to do a lot of the things and you got, you know, uh, commercial contracts with Amazon and with BMW. I could talk to like hours about this, but just to make the a long story short, OpenAI and Microsoft led the next round. NVIDIA came in, Jeff Bezos came in, Amazon came in, Intel came in, and it then became like a huge news. We got a huge markup and we, we were part of like the larger investment as well. So that was a crazy like month that I didn't really sleep. Uh, that closed <laughs> recently. Uh, like the last week kind of thing. Um, and then another really interesting thing that is totally opposite of that is we purchased the uh, Santa Monica Pier. We bought Pacific Park, which is the entertainment complex of, of the Pier. Um, and that is a 30-year-old business that's like a Warren Buffett-style business that throws off a lot of cash. It's got 12 million visitors a year. Um, it's iconic by virtue of what it is and where it is. There's only one. <laughs> one of one. And it's even crazy that we could even buy it. We didn't think that something like this would be purchasable. We got a liquor license for the first time in its 30 year history. So that, so now we're starting to serve alcohol and we're doing a beer garden there. We are doing some other really interesting stuff to kind of make it more like a theme park. You know, the, the, the Olympics are coming there in 2028 which gives us an opportunity to increase the, 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 the amount of visitors that come there, um, sponsorships, you know, this would be a great place for like a Nike or someone like that to, to come in and sponsor during the Olympics and the world cup and those types of things, just some stats. It's the second most visited tourist destination in Los Angeles, uh, next to the Hollywood side, it's the eighth most Instagram place on earth. Assets like this really don't come along very often. And when they do, you got to take advantage of it. <laughs> the once in a lifetime asset purchase, right? And if you want to add some novelty, yes. maybe you can have some uh, AI robots on the Santa Monica Pier <laughs> run, serving run, some running hot dogs. Running the rides, running the bikes. People yeah, will exactly. show up for this. A hundred percent. Yeah, that's great. Where should people find you? Do you have like a, a Twitter handle that you want pe to send people to? Or is there a social media network you're most active on? I'm mostly on Instagram, so it's at Shane Eman, or you can go to shaneeman.com. You can email me through there, whichever one is better. Shane, it's been fantastic having you on the pod. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to see what you do next. If that was this past year, let's see what 2024 has in order. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Shane. That wraps up today's episode. For more inspiring stories and valuable lessons from successful entrepreneurs, be sure to listen and subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for listening. Until next time, keep pushing boundaries and writing your next chapter.